around 10, 10 months and six, 10 years and six months ago, in this room, what the what Chamber of Commerce had for the first time a little office. We rented an office in this building, and uh, people thought it was a closet, but we thought it was a little office. And uh, in, 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 the, in the opening day, that, that we were, for the first time after uh, six and a half years, we didn't have, the, 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 the chamber, the, the records of the chamber were in my, the trunk of my car, so Ruben's car, Simone's car, we got things in the, in the trunk of our cars because we didn't have any office. So we rented for the first time a little closet or office here, and we had an opening ceremony. And in this opening ceremony, we had, at that time, Representative Robert Portman, um, our previous mayor, um, and then we had John Cranley. John Cranley was one of the speakers that night, or you remember that night, but it, it was, it was a just, the group was not as large as this. At that time, maybe the chamber had maybe 40 members. Now we have close to 300. So we have you know, grown a lot, but uh, thank you very much for it. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here with you, and I hope to work with you for uh, many years to come. You guys hear me, okay? And what I want to do is just give you a little background on me and uh, some of the priorities for the city, um, and then uh, some specific issues related to Hispanic and Latin American issues uh, from my perspective, and then open it up to questions and answers uh, and anything that you, know, that you guys are interested in. First, on a personal uh, biographical background, um, I grew up here in Cincinnati in Price Hill and uh, went to Sanix High School. And interestingly, my formative experience in life that really changed my, my life was as a sophomore at St. X High School, I did the school play, mainly to meet girls. <laughs> and we did a play which happened to be picked about a uh, famous Latin American, uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was the Archbishop of El Salvador in the 70s, and he was murdered in 1980. And they did a play about his life, and I was just a peasant. I was killed three times. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, in the context of the play, and being in a Jesuit school, we learned about this history and the importance of the prophetic voice. It was kind of like a Martin Luther King for Latin America. And interestingly, just a year and a half ago, I was in Argentina, and in the president's mansion in Argentina is a picture of Romero, which is interesting. Sadly, on the third night of our show, November 6th, I can't even tell you the date, November 16th, 1989, on that morning, uh, the death squads marched into the Jesuit University in San Salvador, similar to Xavier University, but it's in San Salvador, and murdered six Jesuit priests, the cook and the cook's daughter same way that Romero had been killed nine years earlier. And granted, I was in, you know, they say that those of us from the St. X Mafia are brainwashed. Well, this was pretty powerful brainwashing. And you know, there we were doing a high school play about Romero, thinking that that was long in the past, and those kinds of things didn't happen anymore. And there we were, the day of our show, and six Jesuit priests were murdered day of our show, and the priests at our school knew the priests that were murdered, because the Jesuit community is relatively small uh, internationally. So it was a very moving experience, and I've resolved on that night, and I felt an epiphany that my life would not just be pr pretend play acting on a stage, but that I would get involved in public service to try to live up to the ideals that Romero and others had. So I felt a deep calling that interestingly came out of a, uh, you know, I'm not Latin American, I'm not Hispanic, but came out of a high school play that was deeply involved in the history of Latin America. And I have tried, although uh, not as well as I would like, to learn Spanish, and I've tried to stay involved. So the next summer after that high school play, I went with the Jesuits down to the Dominican Republic uh, for the entire summer. I spent another summer in, uh, in Guatemala, 
Uh, I've been to Mexico. In fact, I was in Mexico just a couple weeks ago. I went to Chichen Itza for the first time, which was great. Also spent some time in Cancun. I'm not sure if that counts. <laughs> Uh, on our honeymoon, I made my wife, whose family is from the Middle East, I made her go down. To, we went to Peru, we went to uh, Machu Picchu, we went to, uh, um, to uh, the Galapagos. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we went to Argentina just a year and a half ago. In, high school, or in, college, or in law school, I went down to visit my buddy who was doing the Jesuit Volunteer Corps in Peru. So I've actually been to Peru a couple times. Been to Belize, um, obviously been to the Dominican Republic. And, and, and a few other places I'm not even thinking of right now. Oh, I've been to Ecuador a number of times, including Quito. So, in, in addition to that, I've made a point of reading um, extensively uh, Latin American authors uh, from, uh, yeah, anyway, it, 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 you know, from Gutierrez, you know, Gustavo Gutierrez on the theology side to 100 Years of Solitude to uh, uh, Isabel Allende to uh, more recent stuff, Maria Rana's books, you know, to uh, Francisco Goldman, who's another uh, Latin American author and Argentinian author. So anyway, long story short is I have a great appreciation and personal uh, experience in South American, Latin American culture and would love to help improve those ties and improve the pipeline uh, here between Cincinnati and the South. It's also a great irony and it's totally coincidental that the Guatemalan population is increasing uh, most dramatically in Preso where I grew up. And I see that as a positive development if we can do it in a way that is safe for the, for the immigrants. And one of the issues when I was on city council was you had a number of folks who were there and were victims of crime but we're worried for a variety of reasons, language barriers, sometimes uh, immigration status about even reporting crimes. And so we worked together on trying to make sure that there were uh, protections in place, no matter what, you shouldn't be a victim of a crime. Um, but anyway, long story short is that I'd like to strengthen these relationships. I'd like since that it be known as a place that's immigrant friendly, and I want to work with you to help make that happen. I also want to work with you to build the wealth and the experience and the positivity uh, here in Cincinnati for people of all the backgrounds, uh, including Hispanic, obviously. And I, as you can tell, I have a personal passion about it. And it is the closest neighbor to us, and so I think it is particularly important. And I want to get involved in immigration issues specifically, and certainly refugee status. I want us to be known as the most welcoming city in the world for refugee issues. I know my good friend Tom's family uh, were refugees from, from Cuba and so many others here. But whether it's Cuba or Guatemala or Mexico or Bolivia or Colombia, wherever, I want Cincinnati to be the known place that, you know, the Statue of Liberty should mean what it says and say what it means. It says what it means. The question is, will it mean what it says? And I want Cincinnati to be the place where if, if there is a political refugee issue, that we are the place that we would welcome you uh, to our shores. So with that background, let me get into more of the city proper discussion. After the election, we spent a little bit of time, we didn't have a lot of time, but we spent a little bit of time come up with five strategic priorities. And I want to just outline those priorities, give you a little flesh on the bones, and then take your questions. There's a million things we want to accomplish as a city, and there's never enough time to do all of it. So the question is, what am I going to focus my time on? So I spent some time identifying five priorities. The first is job growth, economic development. And that's everything from working with you and the Greater Society Chamber and the Black Chamber and all the chambers to promote and build jobs and market our region to the business community in general and specifically both internal growth as well as external growth to Cincinnati. That's sort of the highest level. Then you've got sort of the second level which is where we have the most financial impact is on real estate development, whether today I was cutting a ribbon at 7th and Broadway on the new North America Properties uh, Tower, residential tower on top of the St. Xavier Garage, coincidental, 
<laughs> and uh, or the work that 3CDC is doing, or the work that the Uptown Consortium is doing, or the Port Authority, or the Banks Project, or Over the Rhine, or the Clifton U Square and Short Vine, all of these wonderful activities that are helping to make Cincinnati a vibrant 24-7 city from the river to the zoo. You know, in my opinion, from the river to the zoo, you should be able, you know, this should be the most exciting city in the world, if not in the Mid if not in the world in the Midwest. I think we're, we have a lot of mojo, we have a lot of momentum in that regard, and I want to keep it going. In addition to that, I want to do job, workforce development, job growth for the long-term unemployed. And I'm working with the White House right now on a strategy which the President's going to announce tonight about getting companies, including Procter & Gamble, who I've got to agree to change their hiring practices so that, you'll hear the President talk about this tonight, change their hiring practices so that the length of unemployment is not taken into consideration for hiring purposes. And so if, if, if you and I have exactly the same resume, but I've been unemployed for 12 months, and you've been unemployed for two months, and we're applying for the same job, the statistics show that you'll get an interview and I won't. Just because people will conclude that if I've been unemployed for 12 months, there's something else wrong, even if otherwise we're similarly qualified. So the president has been leading a volunteer effort to get companies to agree not to look at the length of unemployment. And I'm proud to say that I helped convince Procter & Gamble to join in that effort, and that'll be, I don't know, PG will be announced tonight, but, but they'll be uh, mentioned tonight. In addition, we're gonna be investing locally in job training programs that have been proven effective, like Cincinnati Cooks and Cincinnati Works and the Urban League, and things of that nature, to really build the ready-to-work skills of the long-term unemployment. So that's number one. Number two is safety. We are on pace, unfortunately, for the highest homicide rate at the moment in the history of the city. This is a crisis situation. And we will be announcing next week a whole host of strategies to deal with this, including a new recruit class, uh, a new walking patrols and bicycle patrols, a new gang uh, unit to deal with uh, drug gang violence, uh, and many other efforts. Third, is inclusion. And during the campaign, and my good friend Tom is there with me and, and many others, we pledged that we would build a much more inclusive economy with what we could do in the city. Now, unfortunately, the numbers for the city work are very bad. Uh, you know, we only have about uh, Two and a half percent of the city's contracts go to African American owned businesses, despite the fact that the city's about half black. Among women owned businesses, we're only at six percent. And among Latino businesses, the last year that's available, zero. So I have made very dramatic promises to move those numbers in the right direction, and frankly, I need your help. Um, and I'm going to ask a number of you, uh, Alfonso's already agreed, but others I haven't spoken to yet, to serve on a task force to help figure out how we're going to change this infrastructure and culture. And would love to have an ongoing relationship with you as we, as we tackle this issue. But we will tackle it, and we'll do whatever it takes to move the numbers. Um, and I think that's just critically important, uh, not only to build uh, opportunity city for everyone, but also selfishly for all of us. Um, that as we become known as an inclusive city, we will attract more capital, wealth, opportunity, and jobs, and so everybody will be richer as a result. Fourth, in some ways, this should probably be list, listed first, is getting our financial house in order, and it's a mess. And I would the big driver of that is the pension, which is just all bad news. And there's nothing positive to say about it other than we're going to have to make some very tough decisions in order to keep uh, the ability for the uh, deliver tax or, or basic services for tax dollars. It's not the fault of the people who have depended on the pension. Um, they've gotten screwed too by the stock market, subprime mortgage bonds, and all that kind of stuff. 
but the fact is that we don't have enough money and we have to make some adjustments there in order to, to, to just basically deliver basic services to the city. And fifth is making specific, concrete, visible, tangible improvements in neighborhoods beyond downtown and Clifton, uptown area. So whether it's building a square in Westwood uh, to build their quality of life, or building a Wassaway bike trail on the east side, or whether it's working with the port to try to improve Montel, clear, tangible uh, uh, examples of, of positive change. So those are the five areas. Job growth, economic development, safety, inclusion, getting our financial house in order in neighborhoods. And I've talked way too long, and I would love to take all of your uh, questions and answers, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you.